thank you. And uh, thank you for that introduction and hello. I am really excited to join Nerd Night tonight and to share with you the story of some of the wildest Texans around. Um, so I serve as the Texas representative for Defenders of Wildlife. And um, in this role, I lead our Ocelot Conservation Program. A little bit about Defenders of Wildlife. We are a US-based national conservation organization, and we're really dedicated to the protection and restoration of imperiled species and their habitats in North America. And so people often ask me, what the heck is an ocelot? And frequently people actually guess that it's a reptile or maybe a sort of snake, and they're really surprised to learn that ocelots are medium-sized spotted cats with a funny sounding name. Now, if you have heard of ocelots before, it's likely to be in one of these two contexts. Number one, Archer. This is an adult-oriented cartoon, and there is an ocelot named Babu, who is a character on this show. The main character, Archer, is obsessed with big cats, and particularly Babu. Or you might know ocelots from this ecosystem. This is Minecraft, and ocelots wander this landscape. They can be um, tamed and made into pets, I believe. I am actually not a resident of this ecosystem. So what are ocelots? They are medium-sized spotted wild cats. They're about 15 to 30 pounds, so three times the size of your house cat, maybe twice the size of your house cat. And they live to be about 14 to 15 years old in the wild. Ocelots have a unique chain rosetted coat pattern, and every ocelot has a unique spotting pattern. So uh, it's like a human fingerprint, which makes it very convenient when we're studying them. Um, we use camera trap photos like this. So these are cameras set off by motion. Typically, these photos are taken at night, um, but these unique patterns light up on camera, and it makes it so easy for us to identify these individuals. I'll also point out this particular ocelot has a one, two, three on his hip which is sort of a fun thing for us. All right, so I started with this slide, this image. I can tell you for, with certainty that this is not a Texan. This is not a Texas ocelot. The reason I know this is his nose is pure pink. And so this is like a fun little insider knowledge that um, if you see an ocelot with pure pink nose, he is from further south in his range. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Now this is a Texas ocelot, and it's very subtle, but he has gray shading on his nostrils. And so our Texas ocelots do not have pure pink noses anymore, and this is how we can see it. So I, I talked about further south in these cats range. Ocelots currently range from Argentina up to southern Texas, and occasionally we get lone male dispersers in Arizona. Historically, these cats had a broader range that took them into Arkansas and Louisiana and further up into Arizona. Today, Tex Texas is the only home to the northernmost breeding population, and they um, occupy two counties in southernmost Texas. Eastern Cameron County, this is where our federal lands are, the National Wildlife Refuge, that is Laguna, Atascosa, that is a mouthful. It literally means boggy lake, but that is the National Wildlife Refuge that these cats call home in Cameron County. And additionally, in Willacy County, we have an ocelot population living on private lands. So here's a better view of this. The Mountain Dew splash across this map is uh, their historic range, and you can see that corner of Arkansas and Louisiana, we were that the historical record documents these cats in. Today, these cats are limited to these small orange dots here. This is um, Cameron County, this is Willacy County, and then you can see the US-Mexico border. South of that, we have three or four proximate populations. Genetically, they are the same group of ocelots in Tamaulipas, Mexico. Now, quick note, I get a lot of emails and messages about folks who have seen ocelots. Um, this is the bobcat. He has an overlapping range with the ocelot here in Texas. And actually, bobcats are found throughout the state, and they are doing very well. This is a cat who thrives in the suburban margins. Um, we have bobcats here in the green belt. 
um, and they are doing particularly well in Dallas and Fort Worth. Ocelots and bobcats side by side do not look alike. Um, ocelots have that much clearer coat pattern. They have rounded ears. They don't have cheek tufts or what we call sideburns. Again, that spotting pattern is very crisp and well-defined. And they have a long tail. This is crucial. A bobcat gets his name from the term bobbed tail. He has a much shorter tail. Their coat can be plainer spotted, but the spots are much less defined. And they have these characteristic sideburns or cheek floof. And then their ears are much more triangular. So side by side, okay, this is pretty clear. Hmm. What are we looking at here? I see spots. I see black outline. This is what we jokingly call a bobolot. Bobcats and ocelots do not hybridize. They do not interbreed. What we're, we're seeing here is a bobcat who has a very distinct spotting pattern. So they can have spots as well. Again, if you look, it's a lot muddier and more rufused than the ocelot pattern. But you can imagine seeing this fellow in the wild, often within a fleeting second, you might not know what you're looking at. So I love for everyone to report to me when they think they see an ocelot. Um, please, if you can, get a photo. Um, and I love sort of a hobby of mine to help people uh, identify what they are seeing. Now back to our ocelots. Ocelots are dietary generalists. Um, they are obligate carnivores, which is a really fancy way of saying they only eat meat like all cat species. And they are opportunistic hunters. They eat what they can get their paws and claws on. Now what governs this is prey size. Ocelots, you'll remember, are about two to three times bigger than your house cat. They are not a threat to livestock. They are not taking down a cow. Rather, they like rodents, they like birds, they like bunnies, lizards, reptiles, but what they really love are rodents. Now as much as ocelots are not picky about what they eat, they're very picky about where they live. They are habitat specialists. Here in Texas, they live in, on one landscape. It's known as Tomalipan thorn scrub. Tomalipan thorn scrub is very dense, very spiny. It's a matrix of plants. Every time I go work in this environment, I ruin my clothing. It is very prickly and um, full of like sharp edged grasses, uh, succulents, forbs. If you could see this image even clearer, you'd see little tiny thorns on every branch there. These cats love this cover. It's excellent for hunting, denning, raising their young, and protection. You'll remember they eat rodents. Rodents are running through here, and they're not that big themselves. So this affords them protection from wild uh, hogs, coyotes, and other species that might pose a threat to a cat. Ocelots are nocturnal. They're most active at night. We're going to talk later about why that's important. And they have a slow reproductive rate. They have one to two kittens every one, one and a half to two years. So a female will have one or two babies and then they stay with her up to two years. In that time, she will not breed again. And very little is really known about the fertility and pregnancies in these cats because we're still learning a lot more about them. They're so, they're so reluctant, they're so reticent. They hide in the bushes, they only get come out at night. It's really a challenge to study these cats. And so these cats are critically endangered in the United States. And here's what's stunning. There are 80 left in Texas, maybe. 12 known individuals live at Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. The remaining 60 to 70 live on private ranch lands north of that refuge, again, in Willacy County. Okay, why? What's happened to these ocelots that they have decreased so much? In the 20th century, the answer was the fur trade and pets, the pet trade. So um, ocelots have a very luxurious coat, and it was very much in demand with that beautiful pattern when furs were in style. Additionally, they became popular pets. Again, they're medium sized They're not going to harm you like a tiger could. Um, this is the original Babu you're looking at. You'll remember I mentioned there was a character named Babu in Archer. This is Salvador Dali and his pet Babu, who made the social circuit in Hollywood for years, and so this cat was frequently photographed by Life magazine, sort of kicking off that popularity in these cats as pets. 
Today, the pet trade and the fur trade are not as big a concern. They certainly remain a concern, but the more significant reason for decline is habitat loss and fragmentation, meaning the remaining habitat isn't conjoined where the cats can move across the landscape. We're losing this habitat in extreme South Texas to agriculture. You know, this is the valley. This land is very productive. We're also losing it to urbanization. Brownsville is one of the most rapidly urbanizing cities in the country. And also oil and gas interests, which I'll touch on in a bit. The leading known cause for ocelot death in South Texas is vehicular collisions. And I apologize, this image is hard to see. Um, you'll remember these are nocturnal cats. These are fairly small cats. They're moving quickly. Typically males are the ones who disperse. So young males striking out, looking for new territory, or older males who are being pushed off of territory by those younger males are typically the ones we find moving across the landscape. And frequently, you'll remember that land is fragmented. That means crossing roads. In 2016, we had sort of a crisis. We had seven ocelots die on the roads around Laguna Atascosa. You'll remember there are 12 known individuals. And when I say known, these are cats who are documented in ocelot monitoring project. There are likely more, but this is a number that we can definitely identify at the refuge. Okay, so such a limited population with the loss of individuals to threats like vehicular strikes, we have serious concern about inbreeding because of that low genetic diversity. So here is an inbred cat. Okay, so what are we doing? How can we help protect and conserve these cats? Defenders of Wildlife is fighting in the state of Texas, in all 50 states as well, is in Washington, D.C. to protect and defend the laws that protect ocelots and other endangered species. Specifically, the Endangered Species Act is a wildly popular act here in the United States. It often, when people are polled, like 80% of the American public supports the work this act does. And what we're doing now is fighting to ensure that that act remains empowered to protect animals and not to create too many loopholes for private industry and or leeway in enforcement of the act that might allow additional threats and harm to endangered species. Additionally, we're working with partners to protect habitat and repair that connectivity across the Rio Grande Valley. You can see here it's a complex matrix of lands that create corridors. We need protected lands to touch. Now, protected land doesn't necessarily mean federal land. Protected land can also be private lands that have conservation easements or other safe harbor agreements for these cats. Understandably, a number of landowners are concerned about federal intervention. They're concerned about the reach of the Endangered Species Act. And so for relationships like this, we often look to groups like the University of Texas, or I'm sorry, Texas and Texas A&M Kingsville, who has done significant work in this area, creating lasting and meaningful relationships with landowners. Other landowners are very open to working with the federal government, and so they have been sort of um, pioneers in these public-private relationships. But this female cat was photographed late in 2019 on private lands. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has worked with TxDOT, Texas Department of Transportation, to create highway underpasses. Remember, vehicular strikes are killing ocelots. This creates little safe corridors for them to cross under highways. They've also added signage, which in theory might help compel people to slow down on the roads around the refuge. Twelve underpasses have been installed at a cost of millions of dollars. And additionally, the improvement of highway barrier structures. So you'll remember that image of the cat against that, that barrier wall. They've found by removing barrier walls and putting in high-tension um, wire, the cats can pass through and they don't get trapped in the middle of the highway. Positive developments. Animals are using the underpasses. On the right, clearly a bobcat, right? We've got that little bobtail. Here we go, January 2020, we have an ocelot on camera using an underpass. 
March 2020, he showed up back at Na uh, Laguna Atascosa. So he had wandered off into the matrix of private lands and then returned. This is Ocelot Male 331. He is um, sedated there. He is not dead. Um, <laughs> he is resting. But he is a male at the prime of his life in terrific condition. Now, I also mentioned that Defenders is actively working to help prevent other interventions on in the landscape that might harm the ocelot population. Here on the screen, you'll see a map. We have Laguna Atascosa at the top of the map. And then we have these numbers. These are LNG, liquid natural gas processing facility um, sites, proposed sites. Defenders is utilizing legal channels to challenge the permitting of these sites because they are directly adjacent, as you can see, to the National Wildlife Refuge. We have a number of concerns about this, including the bright lights that would be at these facilities, as well as the increased traffic and heavy trucks that would be moving through here. Again, even the loss of one ocelot could affect the genetic diversity of the entire generation at the refuge. A coalition of partners is also working together to restore ocelot habitat. You'll remember, again, these are specialists. They like to live in that tumulip and thorn scrub. Tumulip and thorn scrub is hard to come by. It is not exactly a commercial plant. <laughs> People don't plant thorn scrub in their front yard. And so the National Wildlife Refuge and ranchers who are willing to replant this habitat are the only consumers. And so the University of Texas um, RGV, Rio Grande Valley, have been piloting a, a significant project to um, develop a supply chain to get these seedlings to property owners and to the refuge to be planted into the ground. And restoration is a long game. I, I want to make the point here. You can see in this landscape, it takes time to build that matrix of, of plants that, a habit, that an ocelot would want to inhabit. So that's a long game. But also the recovery of a species is a long game. And there are wins and losses along the way. And the point is to be consistent here, to be making choices that are informed in the best science possible, and to be considering carefully what is best for the species in this place. Um, I'm, I'm right here. This is us starting our ocelot monitoring project. So this is piloted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and really run by a number of interns as well as, well as their senior ocelot biologist on site. Um, this population monitoring uses humane traps to catch ocelots when they're willing to wander into those traps to better understand the health of the population, the dynamics, and the genetic relationships. And so they're nice enough to let me come tag along occasionally. Here are, we have um, ocelot biologist Dr. Hilary Swartz and two interns working on a young male ocelot who was captured in November. So they will fit them either with a radio collar or a GPS collar that allows them to track the ocelot's movement around the wildlife refuge to better understand how they're using that landscape. And this is a different ocelot caught a few weeks later. This is ocelot male 341. He is also at sort of peak robustness in his life. And there is now a um, project underway to gather genetic material from males that is being banked with the thought that in the future, this could also help inform replenishing populations on this landscape. So the, they're extracting semen from these cats while they're tranquilized, and then that is being put on cold stir storage, again, with the thought that we are capturing unique genetic information, or not information, material. Now, in addition to that material, we also are exploring genetic diversity through translocation. You'll remember those three Tamalipan populations in Mexico. Again, genetically, those are the same cats. And so their U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with the, the government of Mexico and the state government of Tamaulipas, as well as a number of universities, exploring the idea of translocating a female from Mexico to the United States. Now, one of the biggest hurdles here is one I think we can really relate to right now, the concern about introducing disease. And so there are many hurdles that we need to clear in terms of ensuring we've done everything possible for 
the health of this translocated cat as well as the existing population hanging out in Texas before that translocation is made. So this is a project that is being thought about, the experts are talking about, but it's slow going. It's also an act of international diplomacy for Mexico to give us one of their rare ocelots. So that's another sort of political dimension here. There are also sociocultural dimensions. So Defenders is, healthy, is leading the effort to create a stakeholder group of local groups that work in the Rio Grande Valley, residents, as well as other NGOs like ourselves, um, local zoos, um, zoos out of Houston, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to discuss how we can raise awareness for the ocelot in the Rio Grande Valley and across Texas, which is actually what I'm doing right now as I speak to you. We're also very interested in fostering pride in these animals. These are not conflict animals. Like I said, they're not killing cattle. They're not creating economic damage for ranchers. So we think there's really opportunity here to, text, to tap into this uniqueness of this Texan. Okay, so what are the ocelots doing to help with all this? They're having babies. And this is so important. Um, prepare for a lot of cute baby ocelot photos. Um, we have two older juvenile ocelots here with their mother. Again, you'll see a lot of these are nocturnal images. Again, that's when these cats are active. Here is a three-week-old kitten. He made the national news that was um, photographed and then put right back in his den in 2016. I, sh I showed you this cat earlier. He was captured in November 2019 and again in January 2020. I guess he didn't quite figure out that he didn't like what happened after he was trapped. Um, so he wandered in again, which was really useful for the team to be able to monitor a cat a juvenile a few months apart, and he then was fitted with a GPS collar. This is a young female who was um, captured in March 2020, fitted with a collar and released. Okay, so the ocelots are doing their part. We've got the government, federal government, state government, local and national organizations all rolling up their sleeves together, fighting for ocelots. What can you do? First of all, I invite you to join us for the Ocelot Conservation Festival. So this is obviously dated, um, not March 2020, um, but March 2021, pandemic, you know, pending. But if it's safe for us to have public events, we will be having our festival of events that includes a fun run, a 5K, it includes ambassador ocelots, it includes a lot of family-friendly activities. This is a great way to come out and actually get to see an ocelot and hear a little bit from the experts. I invite you to follow Defenders of Wildlife and then our local page, Texas, Defenders of Wildlife Texas, as well as the page Viva the Ocelot on Facebook and Instagram because that's going to really keep you up to date on ocelot news, including different moments where you might be able to take action through a comment letter or so signing a petition. There are moments when we really need uh, Texans to speak out loud for their wild neighbors. Finally, consider visiting the refuge. You will not see an ocelot. Again, they are in den dense thorn scrub and they come out at night. Um, you might see we stick an intern in, I, uh, <laughs> in the mascots uniform sometimes. You might see that also, but that's about it. But there are numerous opportunities at the refuge when it is open again um, for recreation and enjoying deep South Texas. You can also, by following us on Facebook, learn more about volunteer opportunities, including trash pickup, as well as habitat replanting days or habitat planting days. And finally, consider donating. Now, this is a tough time. Um, I think everyone's feeling the pinch, so you know, donate as and when you are able. But there are 33 small cats in this world, in their species, and there are seven big cats. Those seven big cats draw over 99% of the funding that is available from grants, from private donors, from uh, you know, foundations. And so that leaves the vast majority of wild cats underfunded, which means we don't have as many resources to study and better understand these animals and to advocate for them. 
And finally, you may have seen these driving around town. We do have a Texas Ocelot license plate. And a portion of this, $22 of your fees associated with this license plate, go directly to the Friends of Laguna Atascosa, where they pay for the Ocelot coll the collars around the Ocelot's necks and other activities directly related to Ocelot conservation on the landscape. So with that, I will turn it back over, but I just urge you to join us in the fight to not let this Texan fade away. Well, thank you, Sharon. That was fantastic. Oh my gosh, so so uh, detailed. And just the very fact that there are ocelots living among us is, is amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really stunning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we got a lot of really good uh, questions from the audience. Um, so, uh, one of them came in, uh, before, uh, you actually, uh, answered it and it was about what can you do? Ah. So, um, that was, that was fantastic. Uh, I think you gave a lot of good information there. Um, and, uh, so we had a couple of questions about the, um, the, the tunnels. You talked about the, the, the underpasses for mm -hmm. them and uh, ha have there been studies to indicate uh, that they're working, that there are fewer road deaths? Um, yes, so the underpasses are a huge success story for wildlife in general in South Texas. So the ocelots are just one of many imperiled species down there and all of the underpasses have cameras on them and we have an amazing array and diversity of species now using them, um, including the bobcats and coyotes you see, but I think we've even had an alligator, snakes use yeah. it. It's just stunning. But um, I, I don't want to curse anything, so I'm knocking on wood here. We have seen a significant reduction in the loss of ocelots on roads. However, we don't want to just jump to the conclusion and draw that, that direct line, but it's certainly helping. As we know, we did have that one ocelot utilize the underpass. Wow. So that was one less time he was on the road. That's great. Great. Uh, another question. Uh, so as far as private lands, um, do, are you, are your organization working with uh, the agricultural sector? And is there anything they can do to make their lands uh, more ocelot friendly? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so, so far we've been mostly thinking about the very large ranches um, that are to the north of Laguna Atascosa because our first goal across the landscape is to reconnect the two ocelot populations that are currently separated from one another. And so the ranches down there are quite large and we um, are working with a huge team. We are not necessarily the, the face of this effort, but rather one of many collaborators exploring where the potential for those relationships are and where the trust lies and, and can be grown. Um, commercial agriculture is not in that corridor. So, so far we're not looking that way, but that is a huge opportunity for growth as we think about connectivity across the Rio Grande Valley. Yeah, that's great. Um, someone mentions that uh, they might even be an asset for controlling pests uh, in fields. Yeah. They love rodents, yes. And one other campaign we're thinking about is um, encouraging people to reduce their use of rodenticide because we don't even know what the impacts of mm. ocelots eating poisoned rodents has been. Right. Um, we had a question, are there any efforts or, or do you know if it's even possible to restore the ocelots to Arizona where they used to be native? Sure. Um, so ocelots are using the same corridor that jaguars are using as well, which is really cool. They're, they're older, bigger cousins, or I should say bigger cousins. Um, you know, that's sort of up to the ocelots, but we are working very hard um, because there's not an established breeding population there, meaning we don't have females. We don't have baby ocelots. But I will say, um, Defenders just announced that we are involved in a lawsuit challenging some of the um, border wall permits in that region because if some of the border wall is built in the most remote version um, reaches of Arizona, it will cut off that, that pathway that, uh, that ocelots and jaguars are using. Wow. Wow. Um, well, I think that's it for questions. Um, 
Yeah, we you you we had a bunch, but um, they came in like during your talk, and you actually answered them preemptively. Um, again, what a fantastic talk, Sherry! Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. <laughs>